So hi everyone, I'm Richard Naylor from the Friends of the Pine Bush Community and co-sponsor with commission staff of today's monthly science webinar, Microplastic Pollution in the Mohawk River Watershed. So as questions occur to you during the presentation, we suggest that you use the Q&A function that's at the bottom of the screen. Just type your question and Dylan will see the questions and then provide them to our presenter at the end. If you have a laptop or a desktop computer, you may need to hover your mouse over the bottom of the screen to see that tab. And for the iPod, iPad, you might have to swipe up. So before Dylan introduces our speaker today, let me tell you all about next month's science lecture webinar. It's on Thursday, November 19th, starting at 7 p.m. And the program will be the effects of prescribed fire on ticks in a Pine Barrens landscape. Uh, ticks don't survive the flames. That's a heads up that we give right in the promo of a prescribed fire. But do the secondary effects of this restoration tool impact tick populations in other ways? So speaker is Dr. Michael Gallagher. He's research ecologist in the Climate, Fire, and Carbon Cycle Sciences Unit with the United States Forest Service Northern Research Station. And you can sign up for the program on the website at albanypinebush.org. So now, with that out of the way, back to the program and over to you, Dylan. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, and thank you everyone so much for joining us this evening. Um, I really appreciate everybody uh, really um, just embracing our new format for our lecture series here. Um, so it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Smith. Dr. Jackie Smith has been teaching um, at Union College in Schenectady. Um, she's a uh, research and adjunct professor, professor in the geology department. Um, and she's been there since 2018. Um, prior to that, she was an associate professor of geology at the College of St. Rose in Albany, New York. Her interests include glacial geology, geomorphology, water resources, climate change, and environmental geology. She received her BA in geology from the University of Maine at Orono. I think I said it wrong. <laughs> Orono, Orono, there it is. Um, her master's of science in geology from the University of Washington and her PhD in geology from Syracuse University. Her doctoral research focused on the history of glaciation in the tropical Andes of Peru and Bolivia. She began investigating microplastic pollution in the Mohawk and Hudson rivers in 2013 after first learning of the existence of tiny plastic particles in personal care products. So that is what Dr. Smith is going to lecture um, um, about for us tonight. So thank you so very much, Dr. Smith, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Dylan. I'm really happy to do this for one of my favorite places, the Albany Pine Bush. And um, this is uh, a picture of one of the rivers in New York. This is West Canada Creek and inset into it is a dish filled with microplastics from the Hans Group Hill in Schenectady. So just so we're all on the same page, um, microplastic is plastic smaller than five millimeters. That's pretty small. And it includes plastic that's either intentionally manufactured to be that size, or is the result of fragmentation and breakdown of larger plastic products. So in these two pictures of microplastics from the Mohawk River, you can see examples of both. These blue and orange spheres, those were deliberately manufactured to be that size. But then you can see there are a lot of fragments here and fibers. Those are all part of the process of degradation of something. So when plastic, plastic is exposed to the sun and the elements over time, it becomes very brittle. It breaks down much more easily. And um, plastic microfibers are shed from clothing. You'll notice this is a Patagonia um, informational page. Patagonia makes a lot of fleece. So fleece is polyester. It's a form of plastic, polyethylene, polypropylene. Um, so laundry wastewater can contain a lot of plastic microfibers. But you can go to, to the store and buy your own microplastics. Um, Plastic grit for sandblasting comes in a variety of sizes. You can see listed down here. Um, you can buy plastic packing material for crafts projects. And then 
the basic manufacturing raw material for you know a plastic pen is what are called nurdles they're plastic resin pellets so these are all things that were deliberately manufactured to be small you may remember back in the day microplastics really came to public attention because of microbeads so manufacturers of facial scrubs added um, plastic little plastic beads this is a picture of some that i separated out to scrubs and then advertised their gentle exfoliating properties and they even added them to toothpaste this is an old toothpaste package and polyethylene is one of the ingredients of the toothpaste so um in december 2015 they were microbeads were banned in the u.s and much of the world, some of the world had led us, much of the world has followed us. And so by 2018, when I went into the store and took this picture, I noticed that not only have they gone out of um, scrubs, but scrubs are now ma making it quite clear that they do not contain plastic microbeads. So that's progress. But we're left with many other forms of plastic that can end up going into wastewater. So one starting point, um, the fibers from clothing and laundry, the scrubs from industrial scrubbing materials, which can still contain plastic particles. Anything that makes it into the wastewater stream and goes to a wastewater treatment plant gets filtered, but most, the majority of um, New York State's wastewater treatment plants don't have the capability to filter out really tiny particles, including microplastics. And so they're discharged with the rest of the treated wastewater, typically to a surface water body such as Milk River, shown here at Cohoes Falls. And there they're joined by all the plastic that's fragmented sort of naturally, if you will, um, even airborne particles and they make it into the water. And so once they're in the water, they are then available to any organism living in the water that might mistake it for food and consume it. And they're also uh, attractive to certain contaminants. So there are things that adsorb onto plastic, including dioxins, PCBs. And so the plastic itself can become a little poison pill. And so of course, our ultimate concern is typically for us humans, and so we wonder, how big is this problem? How much microplastic is getting into water and is it actually making it up the food chain to us? Well, um, it's, it doesn't take much research to realize that um, microplastics are a big problem, um, ubiquitous. This article says, uh, Yes, microplastics are ubiquitous in marine waters from deep, deep ocean sediments to polar ice caps. Um, this just came out last week, uh, a study that showed that microplastics in large quantities litter the ocean basins. Not all plastic is less dense than water. There is plastic that's denser than water, like PVC, um, and will settle out. If microplastics are in marine waters, they're also in marine organisms that filter or consume particles. So um, microplastics have been found in supermarket fish and shellfish. Sea salt, if you take seawater that contains microplastics and you evaporate it to make sea salt, the sea salt is likely to have microplastics in it. Tap water, this is part of the sort of suite of recent studies that have looked at how much are we ingesting. And this study um, made a lot of headlines because they found <laughs> the US had the highest contamination rate at 94%. And it was found in all these buildings, including the EPA's headquarters. And for some people, this is pretty serious. Um, they tested 24 samples of German beer and every one of them had uh, contamination by microplastics. And so uh, it's easy to conclude that 
microplastics have definitely entered our food chain and I have to admire these researchers <laughs> and the volunteers who um, discovered in quite a small sample group, but 100% uh, of the participants had microplastics in their stool. So there's food for thought, so to speak. And then this, this came out this year, a study on airborne plastic. So we usually think about water, but um, these researchers looked at places where um, very, very um, natural, remote places, and they still found microplastics. So back when I started thinking about this, which is now almost eight years ago, um, the question on my mind was, having learned about these plastic particles in facial scrubs, well, if they're, are they getting out, are they getting into rivers? And so that was the starting point for this. And it started with the river in the backyard, which is the Mohawk. So here's the Mohawk River, there's Union, Hudson. And so the early stages of this research um, was a pretty low tech approach, so student projects, minimal funding, um, uh, Brian and Emma here, working on the shoreline with buckets of water and sieves and restricting our view to the very small microplastics, less than a millimeter. We found some, but we realized we really needed to be out in the water for this to be a realistic study. And so in 2016, with funding from New York State EEC, um, we did in exactly that. Expanded the field area from Cohoes in the east to Rome in the west, 185 river, uh, river kilometers, and really ramped up our sampling program using a Zodiac boat, shown here, towing a manta trawl. So a manta trawl looks a bit like a manta ray with arms. So if you look at the cursor down here in the lower left, these are the buoyant supports for the manta trawl, and the water comes in and it goes into a net a long net that toes out behind. The net, net has um, basically the mesh is a third of a millimeter. So we know we're not getting the very, very small particles. So we trawled upstream about a mile, so 1.7 kilometers, and collected everything that was in there. And we also collected sediment samples. Wherever the river was, um, the sediment was fine enough not to block the clamshell. Uh, sampler, the Ekman Grab sampler, and so in total we we got we did 63 trawls, that's the dashed lines, and 64 grab samples between the Crescent Dam and Rome. Then we do the lab work, and so uh, what you get when you trawl is a lot of organic material and some microplastic particles, and so we use wet peroxide oxidation, a way of sort of um, chemically burning off the organics to get rid of them. We do a density separation for the sediment first. Then it's down to identifying. So if your sample looks like this, you're really excited because it's pretty easy to say these are not natural particles. The presence of dyes is a tip off, but there are things that you're not sure about, or you want to refine your identification and say what kind of plastic it is exactly. So, for example, this white piece, what's that? So one of the tools we used at Union College was Raman spectroscopy. And so this is a way of, um, I say, fingerprinting. So by um, shooting basically laser light at a material, you get a distinctive spectrum. And it, it, is, it is the fingerprint of that material in the Raman laser. And so we can distinguish using Raman the polyethylene from the polypropylene. And we can say, well, these are both definitely plastic. If you put glass in there, it comes out totally different. And then um, I got initially sort of excited because there were a lot of spheres in some of the samples. And I thought, oh, they're all microbeads, except they look like little glassy marbles. So um, we used the SEM, the scanning electron microscope, 
with energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy. And what this does is tell you the elemental chemistry of the particle that you're focusing on. So here's a blue sphere. And what the SEM EDX tells us is it's mostly carbon. This is plastic. This is another sphere. Notice it looks a little blobby. The, here, what it's telling us is no, this is actually a silico aluminate. This is basically um, glass. This is a glass sphere with some aluminum and some other things in it. And what this is, is fly ash. This is a legacy of coal burning power plants in the Mohawk Valley. So this is the one that's near Lock 10. It's now Cranesville Block stores block material on there. Um, these are what the coal ash spheres look like. And they, sh they are very distinctive when you look at their chemistry. They can be a little deceptive when you see a white sphere in a sample. So for all this, what did we find? There's the mantratrol doing its job. Microplastics were present in every trawl sample. There was a variation in the abundance, pretty uh, two orders of magnitude, from a low of three to a high of 521 particles. And the two highest samples were here in Utica, in the natural channel of the Mohawk, where it separates from the Erie Canal. We sampled during a rainstorm. We'll see how that might have affected our sampling results later. Um, it was uh, second, the second highest samples were just downstream from downtown Schenectady in the wastewater treatment plant. Got a high sample here, lots of fibers. You can see the bar graphs here are broken up by what was actually in them. The Utica samples were notable because they had a lot of styrofoam, a lot of fragments. This is mostly fibers. And the Schenectady samples, interestingly, so this is 2016. Um, the most microbeads. This was a bit of a surprise to me. Microplastics were present in every sediment grab sample, dominated by fibers. The abundance overall was lower, 1 to 75 particles, um, lower than the trawl samples. That's not a surprise. Um, but to me, it was a bit of a surprise just that we found particles in every sediment grab sample. So our conclusion in 2016 was microplastics are pervasive in the main channel of the Mohawk. They're there. There's a bunch of interesting stuff going on because they don't just increase going downstream. And the variability is high. But this represents two weeks of sampling. So the next step was, well, OK, if the Mohawk is filled with microplastics, are they coming in with the tributaries? So that was the next step. We got another grant from New York State DEC to pursue this. And so in June of 2018, we sampled 21 tributaries and the main channel of the Mohawk in Rome. So here's Rome. So we took a sample before we sampled you know, upstream of any of the tributary samples that we took so that we would know what the background level was. You know, is there already plastic there or is the Mohawk just pristine when it comes in above all these? Uh, different field methods, no boat, two students instead. And here we stayed still and let the river move through the net. So this is a net with the same size mesh. So it's about a third of a millimeter. It has a removable cod end, which is a way of saying a little bag at the end, which could be taken off. Once you've got all the sample down in there and you wash that out, um, we know the size of the opening is basically one meter by half a meter. When we were taking the sample, measure the flow rate with a flow meter and how much of the net was submerged. You can probably see where I'm going with this. So we know how much river was going through there. We timed how long it went through for and we knew how fast it was moving. So we can calculate the volume of water that went through the net during the sample. We were careful to keep it all clean, avoid uh, microplastic contamination of our microplastic sample. So just a backpack sprayer, not river water. So this is um, tap water. 
which we hope isn't contaminated with microplastics. Um, so wash everything down, kept it on a tarp, used glass sample jars and a metal spoon. And most of our field work is, was done during low flow conditions in June. So we sampled three major tributaries to the Mohawk, which is West Canada Creek in Herkimer, East Canada Creek in Mannheim, and then Schoharie Creek at Fort Hunter. And then we sampled um, 18 smaller tributaries. So these include urban streams, um, North Chuctanunda Creek in Amsterdam, Canajoharie Creek in Canajoharie, some suburban streams, Shakers Creek, mm, more about that later, Alplas Kill in Glenville, and then some streams that are sort of undeniably rural. Nine Mile Creek in Marcy is a, is a rural stream. And then we sampled the Hans Group Kill, which flows through the GE Realty plot and then Union College. So this is the on, on campus stream at Union. We got there on June 23rd in the afternoon. And as we started sampling, an enormous thunderstorm, rainstorm broke out. And so we were in the water, mostly the students. Um, and while we were in there, the water rose over a foot. So we sampled for eight minutes. The bag was full, the net was full by then, got out, came back two weeks later. This is what the Hunts Group kill looks like most of the time, not this raging torrent but actually a really tiny stream. And we sampled again. This is some of the macroplastic, I called it, that was included in this rainstorm sample. So what did we find? Um, microplastic particles are present in every sample. So maybe you were expecting that. Uh, the abundance ranges from 10 particles per sample to over 10,000 particles per sample. Um, the highest low flow abundance, remember all the streams were sampled at low flow, is North Chuctanunda Creek at 859 particles. So if you're from around here, you know Amsterdam's an old industrial city. It was the old carpet making center. Um, it has a history, a publicized history of sewage leaks. It's been in the paper. The highest abundance overall, though, was the Hans Group Kill high flow sample. So I say greater than 10,000 particles because I had gotten to about 10,000, 10,145, and then, then we had a pandemic. Um, this is the Hans Group Kill in 1898 on this. USGS topo map. So Union College was only 100 years old then, and the, the Hans Group Hill flowed through undeveloped land into northeastern Schenectady, just, just edging out into Miskiuna, and made a right angle turn and came down through, again, undeveloped land, went out through Union and out to the Mohawk. Then Schenectady grew. It grew a lot in the early 1900s. And so by 1920, the Hans Group Hill was reduced, open air section of the Hans Group Hill was reduced to this stretch. All of the rest of it in the right angle turn had been buried and neighborhoods built on top of it. And so today, here's the realty plot, G realty plot, and here's Union, and it comes out of culverts at the east side of the realty plot, and it goes back into a culvert for its trip to the Mohawk River. Oh, we'll, we'll talk more about the Hans Group Kill, but it receives inflow from combined sewer overflows from storm drains and very likely leaking pipes, including sewage pipes. So that's a bit of a spoiler. Um, fibers are the dominant type of particle we found. There's more than one sample that's 100% fibers, but um, the Hans Group Hill high flow sample stands out because it's only two thirds fibers. Actually has a high percentage of styrofoam and fragments. So if you think about storm drains, storm drains washing things, garbage in off the street, this is where styrofoam and fragments show up. The particle concentration ranges from 0.08, so that's a 
fragment of a tiny particle per cubic meter, a cube of water a meter on each side, to over 206 particles per cubic meter. That's a big range. So the highest low flow concentration is found in North Chuctanunda Creek. So uh, North Chuctanunda Creek also, also had the highest abundance. The next highest is Kennedy Harry Creek, another urban stream, so perhaps not surprising. And then Shakers Creek. So again, if you're from around here, maybe you know Shakers Creek looks very suburban as it's getting ready to reach the Mohawk, but it also it splits and it goes alongside Albany International Airport and it goes to Wolf Road. It actually sort of morphs into a sort of urban stream. And it's a, a, a stream with known contamination. Relatively low concentrations, so particles per meter cubed of water, were found in the three major tributaries. So Schoharie Creek's a big creek, big river, big stream, 1.5 particles per cubic meter while we were standing there sampling. East Canada Creek, a little lower. West Canada Creek is quite a rural stream from its most part. It goes up into the Adirondacks. Um, pretty low concentration. Notice that the Mohawk River at Rome already had microplastics in it. So something upstream of Rome, heading up into the Delta Reservoir area, is already putting microplastics into the Mohawk River. You saw this coming. Um, the highest concentration overall is the Hans Group Hill high flow sample. So um, again, I've counted probably two thirds of the sample um, and gotten over 10,000 particles. So somewhere maybe 15,000 particles in this sample that we collected in eight minutes. Um, these are the biggest of the particles that were pulled out of the Hans Group high flow sample. More typically, it looks like this. So this is all done under a microscope. And there are hundreds of microfibers in this little pool of water. I kid you not. Um, but I should point out, even when the Hans Group kill looks like this, it has 6.6 .6 particles per cubic meter of water that's going down there. So there's not much water going down there but it has a lot of microplastics in it. All right, so rough estimates of particle load. Okay, so this is, this is back of the envelope sort of calculation. But what I've done here is said, all right, we know the concentration, say it's one particle per cubic meter. We know how many cubic meters of water went through the stream in say the 20 minutes that we sampled. So you have one particle per cubic meter and you had a thousand cubic meters go through. You say, okay, in that sampling period, I had a thousand particles. What if that went on for the entire year? Actually, that's the next. The first step is to do that calculation. In general, it comes out much higher than you might expect. So even though the concentration in the Schoharie Creek was only 1.5 particles per cubic meter, that creek's 81 meters wide where we sampled. So if we say the whole stream in that sampling period at that concentration, we had 18,000 particles just in that 25 minutes that we stood in that stream heading out toward the Mohawk. And it goes down from there, a big, big stream, big load, but look at the Hans Group kill. The low flow sample, even in the 20, 25 minutes that we stood there and that water trickled through the net, still 383 particles in theory went down to the Mohawk River. And so if you take all these, and again, wild extrapolation, you say, okay, if this low flow went on all year, and this exact same particle concentration went all year for the entire creek, and we add all of these streams together, how many particles go into the Mohawk? 
It's on the order of 2 billion particles per year at low flow. And you know, you know, you live here, it's not always low flow. It's not always looking like this. We get floods, we get storms. So then we add the Hans Group kill. So if we do the same calculation for the Hans Group kill, in those eight minutes of the Hans Group kill, an estimated 73,500 particles went down to the Mohawk, just in the Hans Group kill, in those eight minutes. And so if you say, it's not realistic to say, what if that went on all year? That'd be crazy, a crazy year. But if you say, that rainstorm was the 14th heaviest rainstorm in 2018. Union College has a weather station, measures 30 minute increments of rainfall. That was number 14. So if you say, okay, there were 14 storms that strong or more, if each of them caused 73,500 particles to go downstream, we're looking at, um, in those 30, 30 minute intervals, we're looking at an additional almost 4 million particles just from the Hans Group Kill calculation. So these start to add up fast. Logical question, <laughs> why is the Hans Group Kill so full of microplastics? Where does the water come from? It's, it's not even two kilometers long at the surface. So we have, we've investigated this um, at Union. Uh, this is my student, Eva Will Willer Bauer's senior thesis project. And this is what we're working with. It disappears in a culvert downstream. This is where we did the microplastic sampling. But it comes out of culverts at the upper end. So if we want to know why it's so full of microplastics, where's the water coming from? Is it storm water that's coming in? But where are all the fibers coming from? Is that sewage coming in? These, this is the upstream. This is West Alley. So this is the upstream end. Cul big culvert, big culvert, small, small. These are not the only pipes. If you walk the channel, you see pipes coming in. Here's one coming out from under one of the bridges. Here, 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 near the ice rink. Um, near Lennox Road. And then if you do some research into sanitary sewers and storm sewers, you find that um, according to the maps down at the city engineers in Schenectady, in the 1920s, um, when the Hans Group Kill was buried, it was basically buried as storm sewers. So the, there are these, this was the old path of the Hans Group Kill. And when it was buried, it was buried as a storm sewer line. And then there, so this is Sheridan Avenue storm sewer. There's the Plaza storm sewer. And then there's the Rugby Avenue storm sewer here. And these are the three pipes that come out at the upper end of the Hans Group Kill. According to the assistant city engineer in the city of Schenectady, it's quite possible and actually likely that either sanitary sewer lines are illegally connected to the storm sewer lines or are leaking and reaching the storm sewer lines. So is there sewage in the Hans Group Kill? Um, Eva did almost a year of sampling mainly for Enterococcus, but also initially some E. coli. These are fecal indicator bacteria, which is just what it sounds like. These are bacteria that live in the guts of warm-blooded mammals, such as humans, at locations, seven locations along the creek, plus one of this pipe. So there's Eva sampling this pipe. And we've also sampled down on the Mohawk River and Riverkeeper, the Hudson Riverkeeper crew has also done extensive sampling along here for Enterococcus. And so our, our results sort of dovetail with their results. So Eva's done the sampling 
this is over 250 samples. And of all of these, there's only one grab sample that does not exceed EPA guidelines for recreational waters. Notice this, this is a logarithmic scale. So that's 100,000 um, MPN per 100 milliliters, which is the way you talk about bacterial colonies. Um, in general, the results for fecal indicator bacteria in the Hans Group Kill um, are order, an order of magnitude or more higher than they should be. So those were grab sample numbers. This is the geometric mean, which is a way of averaging samples so that you have one number to look at. And all the <laughs> beach advisor, the EPA beach advisor is 60 MPM per 100 mils. And so you can see that all of these um, geometric means exceed EPA guidelines. And the highest value is actually that pipe by Wendell Avenue. We did some intensive sampling around storms to see if we could see clear input of storm water and sewage during rainstorms. And I think you can see from these graphs that there is clearly a sharp spike in the Enterococcus values um, that go along with the increase in rainfall. If you break it down a bit further and start looking at what's the lag time, it appears that the best fit is with a six hour um, lag time. So maybe it takes some time for whatever uh, water is coming into the Hans Group Hill to get there, but I know from personal experience that the rise in um, water level is almost instantaneous. So it appears that sanitary sewers discharge to the Hans Group Hill. They do it to some extent at low flow because almost every one of our samples, no matter how high or low the Hans Group Hill is, has fecal indicator bacteria in it but especially at high flow. And so if you see, as go the bacteria, so go the microplastics. So what I saw in my sampling was when the rainfall was heavy, the microplastic load was high. And what we see is when the rainfall is heavy, the bacteria level is high. All right, so the big question, of course, are microplastics harmful? And this is where we sort of step out of my area of expertise and we start looking at what who the medical and biochemical and biological experts say. So the National Institute of Health has this microplastics um, page on their Talkstown page. So that's recognition that um, microplastics are something of concern. Um, they say right up front, there's no, there is scientific uncertainty about the hazards of microplastics. So I always think to some extent, it's a question of scale. If I eat a microbead, chances are it's gonna make its way through and I'm not gonna experience any harm. If I'm a tiny krill and I eat a microbead, it may take up most of the space in my stomach and I may starve to death. Um, on the other hand, if the particle is small enough that it can actually pass through um, the membranes in your body and start infiltrating other parts of you, that's a that's a matter another another matter. So there is a growing body of research that suggests or examines the implications for human health. Um, microplastics in seafood, tissue accumulation of microplastics, environmental exposure to microplastics. There are a lot of review articles. Most of them end up saying more research is needed and I believe more research is needed. And I, this um, article came out this year. And to me, this is perhaps um, as a non-biologist, non-neurobiologist, this is perhaps the most frightening idea that microplastics could be neurotoxins. 
So this article looks at research. It's a review article that looks at research on the effects on brain tissue. And they, they go through how they can be taken up by organisms and potential side effects or effects. And again, it, the conclusion is we need a systematic comparison of the neurotoxic effects of different particle types, so on. And that's underway. This is a very active area of research. And it's, so it's not something I have an answer to, but it's something I, I worry about. Okay, so let's talk about some conclusions. Let's state the obvious. Microplastic pollution is pervasive in the aquatic environment. Um, my, my work in the Mohawk watershed, the Mohawk River watershed, has demonstrated to me that they are present throughout the watershed, both in the water and in the sediment. I think what, um, especially the Hans Grootkill tells us, but also in retrospect, those samples from Utica, is that wastewater, including sewage, is transporting microplastics. So the high, high fiber loads, those to me say sewage. But um, some of it's probably airborne. There, we're probably breathing microplastics as, as we live and breathe right now. But um, I think wastewater is a primary carrier. One of the really surprising things to me that came out of the research with the tributaries was that microplastics from one small stream at high flow, the Hans Kill, is the smallest stream we sampled, are three times the microplastics from the many larger streams at low flow during longer time intervals. The power of extreme events High flow events are major mobilizers of microplastics. So I think that's something to think about, especially in light of one of the climate change predictions is that we're gonna see bigger, more intense storms. And so as if there wasn't enough to worry about from that, also think about that as a mobilizer of microplastics. And then, it's hard to get away from the fact that the Hans Group Hill and others, so I'm thinking North Checkton Under Creek in Amsterdam, for example, illustrate the role of infrastructure failures in microplastic pollution. And so these are failures, sometimes they're failures of design, sometimes they're failures of um, our infrastructure in the Northeast is so old. The, the storm sewers that we're talking about with the Hans Group Hill are literally a hundred years old, some of them. If they haven't cracked, then you know, good on them. Um, and then the illegal connections that may or may not occur. Um, it's all at some point, many of these problems come down to money. You know, Amsterdam knows it has this problem with sewage leaks, but that's an expensive fix. And then there's the big question, and the one that I, I don't have the expertise to address, and that's what are the health effects? So that's, that's where I'm leaving it, with the big question. So I am happy to take questions. Right, wow, very enlightening. Um, uh, we do have a couple questions. Um, <laughs> Richard wants to know if you eat much fish. <laughs> I don't eat many fish guts. Um, I do eat fish, but I don't eat the part that I'm pretty sure has most of the microplastics. How's Good. that for an answer? <laughs> Makes me feel better because I eat some fish. <laughs> um, Darwin says... Yeah. Um, in bottled drinking water, to what extent are microplastics shed from the inside walls of plastic bottles into the water contents? The simple answer is I don't know. Um, 
that's also the complex answer. Um, my gut feeling is, I, my recollection of that research into bottled water was that much of what they were seeing was microfiber, like nanofibers. So you wouldn't expect those to come from the inside of a bottle. It's a good question though. Mm. Um, and I would have to review that research to really definitively answer that question. So the case there would be that the water was going into the bottles contaminated already? I, that's my recollection. I would not swear to that in court. All right. All right, let's see. Um, Jennifer says, has there been any evaluation of the fish in the Mohawk specifically for microplastics? Um, oh, that's such a good question. Um, I'm trying to remember whether Dr. Barbara Braybetz at Hobel Skill has actually done fish studies. Um, it's a bit tricky because nobody wants to kill fish. Mm. Um, actually, a student of mine, a high school student who was doing a research project with me, um, looked at fish in the Alplas Kill, one of the tributaries, and she developed this. She read about this, and she developed this method of um, stroke. Her father would catch a fish with a painless hook. And she would stroke its belly until it pooped and then look at the poop and then release it. Um, she found some microplastics. Um, so I wish I knew the answer to the question about the Mohawk, um, but I don't. Well, seems like a good possible graduate project. It does, it does. <laughs> it's definitely a biology project. Um, because you got to know how to handle fish. Hmm. Um, let's see. Oh, someone said as a resident of the watershed, it's wonderful to hear from an expert. Um, and Portia says, besides not buying clothes made from plastic, would you recommend those microplastic filters you can attach to your washer? It seems that clothing fibers was a big part of what you found. Yeah. Um, I think clothing fibers are a big part of what I found. Um, granted, some of the fibers in the North Chuctanunda Creek were probably carpet fibers, but um, yeah. Um, I have not tried one of those filters. I did decide I was gonna buy more wool, less polyester. Um, uh, I'm interested in it. I would be interested if someone has tried one of those. I worry that it might impede the exit of air from the dryer. Um, oh wait, it's a washer filter, isn't it? Oh wait. Yeah, yeah, they said washer. Um, no such a thing existed. Yeah. Um, I guess I would worry, I mean, our, our washer is old. I, I don't want to mess with it and fear it breaking. So I would be worried that by trying to filter out particles that small, especially if you do and you'd filter everything, um, would you impede the outflow of the washer? It's a, it's a good idea. Um, it seems like something that, as, a savvy manufacturer of washers could say now with microplastic filters. Um, yeah. So that's my inconclusive answer. Interesting. She said, by the way, um, the Cora ball is one. So if anybody wanted to look them up. Yeah, I have heard of that. I haven't tried it. I'm intrigued. Yes, I'll write it um, down. Giselle says, could the microplastics in the guts of fish potentially have neurotoxic and overall health effects on fish also uh, if it affected humans? Disclaimer, not a biologist, um, but my, my, what I've gotten from 
the literature is that something that biologists worry about. And um, so the question is, would those neurotoxins affect us if we eat that fish? I think it was both. I think it was both. Yeah. Uh, would it affect the fish and then would it affect humans eating the fish? It seems like somewhat of a scale problem. Um, if the microplastic affects the fish, well, I guess that would be cumulative over time. Um, and then we eat the fish, we eat it once a what? Maybe? I'm gonna go with maybe on that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just trying to think it through. It seems as though it would pro I don't want to minimize the possibility, but it seems as though it would be um, whatever the fish is getting, you're only getting a little part of that. How about that? So you might have to eat a lot of fish. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, looking at mercury in fish, they say you can still eat like from certain bodies of water, like once every month or something. <laughs> yeah, which really makes them appetizing. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Jeff says, do you know if there are any studies comparing the microplastic outflow of septic tanks versus wastewater, wastewater treatment plants? I don't. Um, our septic tank goes, it has a leach field in our backyard. And so if there are say nanoplastics going out into that leach field and then percolating down, they could potentially reach, they would reach bedrock, they could potentially get into the groundwater. Um, but the wastewater stream coming out of a wastewater treatment plant, that's, I, that's, okay, first answer was I didn't know of a study, but this answer is, I imagine it's higher because they, there's just so much water going through a wastewater treatment plant versus a septic tank. And mm -hmm. a septic tank is usually going into a leach field. Gotcha. Um, yeah, and speaking of that, I had a question. I'm going to interject a little bit here, but I, somebody else texted me about it also. So you're, you see these more microplastics from wastewater. Um, are you thinking that these microplastics are then, are they being excreted by humans or is it coming from like laundry facilities? Because there's people aren't like probably flushing plastics or styrofoams, right? Well, when I first started this research, people were using facial scrubs. Those were going down the sink. But then there's also all the laundry wastewater. Um, so all that gray water that gets produced when you do laundry, that goes to the same place. And then um, the whole microplastics and stool samples, that came out pretty recently. It hadn't really, that had, hadn't really reached my consciousness. But I think <laughs> that, that whole load. And then remember that, um, Wastewater treatment plants are also dealing with uh, commercial establishments and all their wastewater. So the laundromat or the hotel with the laundry facilities, um, those are also going to wastewater treatment plants. So did I veer off the question? No, I no, I can't answer the question. Yeah. Uh, okay, back to the uh, Q&A. So someone says, are there specific filters we can use to filter microplastics in tap water? Um, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say, um, yes, up to a point. I think as I've spent more and more time thinking about microplastics, I become more and more concerned with the nanoplastics, the very, very, very small particles. And I think we regular 
citizens would probably be hard pressed to come up with a filter at the store that was going to filter out nanoplastics from our water. Um, and when they talk about microplastics in drinking water and tap water, they are talking about nanoplastics. They're talking about really small particles. Um, I'd be interested to know. Well, uh, okay, I don't have a definitive answer for that. Um, but I'm thinking about it. So while I think about it, we should go to another one. All right. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I have a Brita, but I don't think it advertises that it filters out nanoparticles. <laughs> yeah, um, there's a downward limit on size to every filter. Otherwise, you're not letting anything through. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. um, okay, Jordan says, hi, Dr. Smith. I have read that some researchers have found potentially pathogenic bacteria on microplastics. Have you found any fecal bacteria on the microplastics? Well, that's a good question. Hi, Jordan. Um, uh, we've had found fecal bacteria and we found microplastics, but we haven't, um, this, the sort of the fecal bacteria weren't really on our radar per se when we were really focusing on the microplastics and um, before we had processed them all. So once you've done peroxide oxidation, they're gone, um, I hope. Um, but that does seem like an obvious research step. All right. Uh, Mikey says, some communities, including I think Colony, use Mohawk wa River water for their city supply. They Has their water been contaminated? How about Schenectady water aqu aquifer water? Um, Colony is one of the communities that does pull water from the Mohawk. So they really have a vested interest in everything that happens in the Mohawk. Um, I don't know if they have reported, I don't know if they actually test for microplastics in their drinking water. Um, Schenectady Aquifer, um, I don't think they test for microplastics in their drinking water. Um, so, so there, <laughs> there's a non-answer. <laughs> uh, one could test, but you'd be clearly, you'd be testing for nanoplastics. And that's sort of a level of equipment that I don't have access to. Gotcha. Ryan says, since all water has some level of microplastics in them, do you think that distilled water also contains some level of microplastics? He says, I use this for my neti pot. Huh. Um, I suppose if you're, well, so in theory, I guess you're, you're boiling off steam and then condensing it to make distilled water and my sort of primitive understanding of making distilled water. Um, I'd like to think that the nanoplastics weren't being transported in the steam. I don't know if that's true. So I don't know if that's the case. Hmm. Lots of good questions tonight. Yeah. Uh, Very good. Oh, Amanda brings up another um, washing machine um, additive, I guess, called a guppy bag. Mm -hmm. And she asks if maybe that could be adapted on a larger scale. Oh, is this is this a bag that goes over the outflow? I I don't know what a guppy bag is. Let me see. Did she? She's. Let me see if she said anything else. Uh, Amanda, if you. Oh, she says yes. Yes. Like a little bag that goes over the outflow, sounds like. Yeah. So these seem like things that some clever 
engineering person should come up with. As I say, I worry about when you're trying to filter particles that small, that it's going to keep, you know, once things start building up on it, it would impede the flow. But I'm not an engineer. Maybe you have two levels of filtration or three. So yes, I'm going to say in theory, yes. Make your guppy bag a microplastics guppy bag. Yes, but still call it the guppy bag because that's fun. <laughs> or, or patent some other name. <laughs> Minnow bag. <laughs> um, Darwin says plastics have been around for a small number of years since the 1940s or 50s to present. Um, is there a way to date the age of the microplastics that are collected from the environment? Hmm. Hmm. Uh, not one that leaps to mind. Um, it's something that we've sort of talked about in the lab setting. Um, it'd be great to know how long, the, what the residence time of these was. Um, I suppose if you were a plastic chemist, maybe knew ins and outs of variations in plastic manufacture over the years, you might be able to come up with something. Or you had samples of plastic going back. You probably, that would be an interesting research project for a materials scientist. Yeah, that would be interesting. It yeah. would be interesting. I would be interested in that. I don't yeah. know the answer. Are we still dealing with plastics from the 40s here? <laughs> yeah. Huh. Yeah, that would be interesting. Uh, Steve says, have you or anyone else looked at well water or municipal water supplies? I guess you kind of answered that. But he also says, are ecosystems or humans able to filter out microplastics? Um, sort of in their bodies, I'm assuming. Um, I guess if well, you're a filter... Ecosystems, so he might mean environmentally. Like, can we create something that could filter them out? Um, well, I said most, well, um, well, for organisms, wait, I'm still a little confused. Do you mean make a thing that will filter for organisms or can like filter feeders like mussels, can they filter it out? I would think I think there's a certain filter it out of the environment, like, like, um, and Steve, uh, let, feel free to let me know if I'm wrong. Um, but kind of the way that like, um, wetlands a lot are talked about as, as like biofilters for cleaning. Oh, yeah. Yeah, actually, we've wondered if microplastics get sequestered in the wetland areas at all, which is not great for the microplast the wetland areas, mm. or anything that lives in them. Um, that's really almost a million dollar question. Can, can we figure out a way to get them out? Can we stop putting them in? Can we keep them from getting in? Once they're in, can we figure out a way to get them out? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so more work needed. Yeah, well, hopefully work like yours brings that to the forefront that this is something we need to figure out clearly. Yeah. Well, even if it's like we're working, we're, we're, we have sort of a working group, for the Hans Group Kill. And so you do what you can at the scale you can to try to fix a problem. That's my take home message. Yeah, and kind of um, related to that, Giselle says, do you think the advancement of hemp-derived clothing could help? Um, if it's more naturally, um, if it's more natural, could its particles and fibers be more biodegradable? Hemp, hemp clothing? Um, I imagine so. Um, I said I decided to wear more wool, um, less polyester. So... Yeah, I would think so. I, hemp is basically a fiber, a natural fiber. 
In theory, it should biodegrade, although it's probably got dyes on it, but <laughs> lesser of two evils. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jackie says, could it be that microplastics are coming from plumbing and piping that has changed to PVC instead of copper? Interesting. Um, uh, well, I guess I wouldn't say, no. um, I'm trying to think how, how you get it to erode to make the microplastics. Um, because most of what is going through plumbing is liquid or soft. So, but, well, so I would think maybe less so, um, but I wouldn't rule it out at all. But I'm just, I'm trying to think of how you get, without throwing sand down your toilet periodically, how you would actually get those little bits of PVC to come off. Mm. Huh. Uh, let's see. Mike says, could plastics be mechanically broken down by cars on city streets and add microplastic to the load and through the storm drains? Tires are actually, tire wear is a form of microplastic. Um, tires are not made out of rubber from trees these days, for the most part, at least. And so, yeah, there are whole studies devoted to abrasion of tires and that, that load. And some of what I saw in the Hans Group Kill was little black particles that look like tire wear. Uh, also paint from roads paint from bridges, paint is mostly acrylic. Um, so yes. Uh, Mike also says, was the efficiency of your filters considered when viewing the amount of microfibers collected? I guess, is it possible your <laughs> collecting equipment missed anything? Oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> These are all minimum values. Partly it's my eyes looking through a microscope, identifying particles. It's partly, can we get every last microplastic off the, the net? Then once, it's, once we're treating it, can we get every last leaf washed? Yes, all of these numbers are minimums. Hmm. Absolutely. Even more scary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, April said, is there any similar ongoing research in other parts of the United States? It might be interesting to generate a map of the results. Yes. Um, in fact, the USGS has done some very interesting studies in the Great Lakes. Um, uh, U.S. Geological Survey, sorry, for those of you who aren't geologists. Um, so they, they do water. Um, that's one of their primary concerns, along with earthquakes and volcanoes. They do water and water quality. And so um, a lot of our methodology for the tributary study was based on a big study that the USGS and um, academic scientists collaborated on in the um, tributaries to the Great Lakes. Um, yes there are people doing microplastics all over the country. And one sad thing about the pandemic is there are no in-person conferences because that's when you get together and you all, you find out, you know, people are doing this everywhere and it's very exciting and you all compare your results. So, so that's what we're not doing right now. <laughs> yeah, it would be interesting to see it all mapped. Maybe sometime in the future. <laughs> um, George says, where do these microplastics come from? What products? Uh, depends what you're talking about. Um, uh, if you, if anything, anything that's made of polyester, polypropylene that you wash will shed fibers. So that's a source of fibers. Um, a styrofoam cup, that has coffee in it 
will break up into hundreds of microplastic particles. So a lot of those, those um, styrofoam particles in the Hans Kill, that's from a chunk of styrofoam. Um, a plastic shopping bag sits out for a couple of years, starts to break down. Those are the films, the category that is called film, those very thin, flexible plastics. Um, any, any piece of plastic that sits out for a couple of years in the sun, you can go and snap it off and step on it, crunches up into particles. Tire particles, um, we see very few microbeads these days. But occasionally one washes through. Someone's hoarding some old scrub somewhere. Um, if you, yeah. <laughs> and there's actually um, a contamination problem associated with those myrtles, the raw material of plastic, like secondary plastic manufacturing. You know, when you make a plastic cup, you put those myrtles in. Um, if those get spilled while they're being loaded in a yard or a train overturns and spills them, they end up getting washed out. And they're, you know, they're big for microplastics, but they're still basically microplastics. Um, there was a, yeah, I'll leave it there. Um, Steve says, do you have any policy recommendations for reducing microplastics in the water? Can we do anything other than ban plastics? <laughs> Um, I'm trying to do that. Um, well, I think you know, it's always a question of, as I say, money. Part of it is fix the infrastructure. If a lot of the microplastics are in wastewater, stop allowing wastewater to reach streams untreated. Um, fix the sewage leaks. Uh, help it takes money to upgrade a wastewater treatment plant so that it has tertiary treatment and can actually filter out microplastics. Um, and of course, I'm talking about microplastics and not nanoplastics. Um, those are a place to start, but it involves um, infrastructure spending, I guess. Damn. Hard to make those things happen. <laughs> it is. It's on my mind because of the Hans Group kill, but yes. Um, Jackie says, did they use mass spectrometer to determine the chemical makeup of the microplastics to determine what is the main source? Oh, sorry, this is Tom, actually. <laughs> it's Jackie's husband. Um, uh, we didn't. We used Raman spectroscopy to distinguish when we, when we felt we needed to. Um, but to do, um, no, uh, the simple answer is no. Um, yeah, I guess that's, that's, that's the answer I'm going with. <laughs> All right, I've got a long one from Janet. Okay. So Janet says, I live in an area whose storm drains connect to the plaza storm drain that you showed on the map of the Hans Groot Kill. During a high rainfall event a few years ago, we learned that some of the local houses have laundry drains that connect with the storm drainage system instead of with the sanitary sewer, which they're supposed to connect to. If these houses are routinely discharging laundry really? water storm drain, would this discharge be part of the low flow drainage into the Hans Groot Kill and not expected to increase during high flow? And does that mean that the high flow event is mainly drawing street runoff, which does not come from laundry or sewage? Um, that's very interesting, Janet. If you are the Janet, I think you might be, then we should talk later. Um, uh, yes. If Gosh, laundry connected straight to the storm sewers. Well, that's exactly the sort of thing that would feed microplastics in high flow or low flow. Um, so, but the high flow pulse um, 
clearly at high flow, the storm sewers are filling and, and somehow that seems to be drawing in more sewage or it's just washing stuff out that was sitting there. Um, I feel as if this is a, this could be a much longer discussion of great interest. Mm. Perhaps not right now. <laughs> Yeah, sounds like maybe, um, I'm probably going to butcher her name, but it looks like her name is, uh, well, maybe I shouldn't say it because I don't want to give it away, but um, can she email you to contact you for, to get in touch? Yep. yep. Awesome. Great. Um, Giselle says, do you think the pandemic has potentially increased the number of microplastics? Ooh, interesting. Um, because people are home, washing their clothes more? Um, hmm. I don't know. We haven't been sampling because there's been a pandemic. Um, and also <laughs> because they were finding, they're using wastewater as a, a way of checking for COVID. Um, so we mm. don't want us waiting around in the wastewater. Um, well, I, a lot of variables there. Don't know. I don't have an instant answer to that. Hmm. I mean, it might have on the on the small scale because we did. I know that there was a plastic ban that they went into effect like earlier yes. in the year. Plastic bags and stuff, and I think they they brought them back in the yep. grocery stores because they didn't want people bringing in their own bags for a while. Exactly. So. Interesting. Yes, you're right. Maybe it's very distressing change. I think um, they're, I think they're back to at least around here. They their yeah. plastic bags are gone again now. But there was a period when the grocery stores were allowed to bring them all back. Put so all there's, back. if you, that's interesting. If there were a pulse a spike in the, the amount of film, thin plastic showing up in the microplastic load, maybe you could connect the dots there. I don't know. I wish I did know. I think we would all agree you shouldn't be sampling wastewater if that's a source yeah. of COVID. <laughs> During a pandemic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, Janet did write again. She said the public works director told, um, told them about the situation there when many of the houses flooded. Um, she, she also said her last name starts with an H and she said, we'll talk later. Um, okay. Let's uh, April says, there might be an ongoing research about super enzyme engineered to consume plastics. Do you have any oh, comments on this? I see these stories and I'm very excited about them. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that, it's, that they will come up with something and it won't be one of those things where it's like, yay, it eats all the microplastic and it also poisons all the otters, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> it would be something that doesn't have a horrible side effect. But it actually just does what it's designed to do. Um, again, not my field. That end of the microplastics, that's the biology end of the field. But um, I, I like to think that smart people are working on this problem night and day. I hope. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> Um, it looks like Richard did some research. He said, it looks like a carbon filter can do as small as 0.5 micron particle. Wow. Um, I don't, I don't know what qualifies as nano. That sounds pretty nano to me. Oh, he said most filters don't have a micron scale, but then Ron points out, then you still have what's in the filters and not filters either need to be cleaned or disposed of. So how do you, then what do you do with that material? <laughs> Well, if you send it to the landfill, that's in the landfill. And it's, you know, contained within the landfill. Except that the leachate, of course, goes to the wastewater treatment plant, gets discharged with the rest of the wastewater. Hmm. There's a <laughs> paradox. <laughs> <laughs> the other, I mean, the other view is we just adapt and we learn to live with a plastic load in our bodies as we have been, I'm sure, for the last however many years we've been living on that 
cheerful note. <laughs> All right, maybe this might be the last one. Um, Mike says, is there a correlation between airborne microplastics and water contamination from rainwater? There probably is. I, I think the, well, again, there's a simple answer is, I don't know what the correlation is. I haven't read a paper that correlates them. But um, the airborne, so this is, this is a field that's been um, growing rapidly or expanding rapidly. Um, and I think the, the research into airborne um, contamination is fairly recent, you know, a couple years. Um, I imagine out there somewhere right now, some brilliant grad student is doing exactly that. I, that's what I'm thinking. Well, more to learn. <laughs> all right. Um, I think that's all of the questions. Um, someone did say thank you um, for all the information and keep up all the great studies with you and your students. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and thanks for a very interesting and informative talk. So I think we'll wrap it up for the night. Yeah, that was wonderful. Thank you oh, thank so, you. so much. It was fun. Strange, but fun. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you everyone who attended. Um, and thank you especially to Dr. Smith for taking the time to teach us all about microplastics tonight. Thank you for the invitation. It was a pleasure. All right. Have a good night, everybody.